I'm Robert Summercrest, Dean of the Terry College of Business, and I want to welcome all of you to this month's edition of Terry Third Thursday. Um, welcome also to those of you who are new to our Executive Education Center, the, the TEEK as we call it, the Terry Executive Education Center, where we run our uh, Executive MBA and other executive programs here in Atlanta, as well as try to keep in touch with our alumni. Let me begin by telling you that uh, without our sponsors, it would be impossible for us to do this type of a, a quality program for you. And I want to uh, begin by recognizing Bank of North Georgia, our corporate sponsor. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there may be a few people from Bank of North Georgia here today. Can I get you to, to raise your hand so we can recognize you if you're from Bank of North Georgia? We're also very uh, uh, appreciative of our media sponsors. We've got two media sponsors that help to, to get the word out about our events, including Terry Third Thursday, and that is uh, Public Broadcasting Atlanta and the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And can I get you to recognize? Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, just briefly, I want to mention a couple of our upcoming speakers. Uh, next month in March, we've got Joel Babbitt, he is CEO of Mother Nature Network, and um, this is uh, Mr. Babbitt's latest venture. It's only about a year old. It is fast becoming the Internet's leading source for environmental news. So if you look at uh, MNN.com, you'll see what I'm talking about. And some of you probably know uh, Joel's name. Uh, he has a long and distinguished career in advertising, and most of it done here in Atlanta. Uh, after that, um, going to a UGA theme, we'll have our new basketball coach, or relatively new, Mark Fox, will be here in April. Um, the month after that, in May, on the uh, occasion of the 225th anniversary of the University of Georgia, we will have President Michael Adams as our guest speaker. And then uh, in June, we'll have James Shepard. And I think uh, many of you know James as uh, chairman of the, the Shepard Center. Um, by the way, uh, I learned uh, just a couple days ago that the, the Harvard Business School will be recognizing James for his accomplishments, so we're very proud to count him among our alumni. One, one last day, uh, date I want to mention, that's April 24th. Um, if you don't know about that already, that is when the Alumni Board hosts the Alumni Awards and Gala for us. Uh, it's going to be at the Intercontinental uh, here in Buckhead the evening of the 24th, and we'll be recognizing three... Um, alumni award winners, three distinguished alumni. Phil Casey, uh, he is chairman of the board of Grudeau Ameristeel. Uh, Jay Davis, many of you know J Jay from his uh, uh, ties here to Atlanta. Jay is uh, chairman and CEO of National Distributing Company. And Garrett uh, Gravison, uh, a young alumnus, uh, he is CEO and co-founder of the Global Lead Program. So uh, let's move on to today's program, why all of you have come. And I am very proud, very happy to introduce today's speaker, Kessel Stelling. Kessel is someone that I've gotten a chance to know over the three years or so that I've been here at the University of Georgia. And I can tell you that he embodies all the qualities that make a true leader. In a short amount of time, he has taken Bank of North Georgia to becoming one of the most respected banks in the region. Um, and always uh, that type of growth and that type of uh, reputation starts at the top. Uh, as president and CEO, Kessel brings an attitude of empowerment, a commitment to team members, and a down-in-the-trenches work ethic. Kessel's a 30-year veteran of the banking industry. Uh, he had his first job in the printing department of First Railroad and Banking Company in Augusta, and that was while he was still in high school. By the time he was a senior at UGA, he had been promoted to head teller at the Fort Gordon branch and already had 14 people reporting to him. And since then, uh, he's continued to build his career with successful financial institutions. Kessel's influence isn't limited just to the banking industry. He gives a lot of his time and talents to an amazing number of community organizations. I've come to appreciate his service uh, and advice as a member of our Terry Dean's Advisory Council. Uh, and at a time when he has been accomplishing so much in his career, our Alumni Award uh, recognized him last year as a, a Distinguished Alumni Award winner. Um, I know that uh, that recognition was especially meaningful to Kessel 
um, and his family because um, as much as Atlanta and Cobb County have played central roles in Kessel's life, I think so has the University of Georgia and the Terry College of Business. Kessel and his wife, Carol, met at the University of Georgia. Uh, they have had uh, two sons who came through the Terry College. Uh, Chris uh, received his finance degree in 2007, and he's currently volunteering on our young alumni board. Uh, their other son, Drew, is a senior at the Terry College. And there's, uh, of course, the person who started it all, and that's uh, Kessel's late father, uh, Kessel Sr. He graduated from the business school in 1945 and served as a city controller of Augusta until his retirement. So whether it's uh, Augusta, uh, Athens, or Atlanta, uh, Kessel's family has uh, deep roots here in Georgia, and uh, the state is no, uh, no doubt uh, better for them and better for Kessel. So Kessel, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, please uh, help me uh, give Kessel a warm welcome. Uh, thank you, Robert. And I would just add that uh, my son Chris and his wife Kyle are actually here. My son Drew is a senior at Georgia, which means he'd be waking up in another six or seven hours um, <laughs> and might catch this through a uh, podcast or something like that. I also remember those days in the printing department. And these days, I kind of wish I was back there a lot less, uh, <laughs> a lot less stressed. For those of y'all that don't know Robert, though, I really do want to thank him for his leadership and his passion and for what he does to make the Terry College greater and greater every day. And if you don't know him, you ought to get to know him. And he's very accessible. And Robert, I can't thank you enough for what you do. And I want you to take back my thanks to um, President Adams for the entire university for what they've done for me and my family and my extended family and so many of my fellow team members um, that are here today. I actually had the privilege of being um, at a black tie dinner with Robert um, Saturday night at the aquarium in the ice storm. and. I sat with President Adams as he um, recognized some of the true heroes of this university. It was those people who had given, in some cases, five million or more um, to the university. And so I want to say something to you all about that. That sounds like a big number. But first of all, thank you for your gift of time to the university because you're here today and that shows you care something about the university. We even have uh, Robert, a couple of Illinois graduates over here in the far corner. I don't think they have a business school, so they are here um, learning today. <laughs> um, but not just a gift of your time. Over the years, the university, and you all hear about the cutbacks, it just can't do what it does, and our business school can't do what they need to do without your gifts. So five million might seem like a stretch. A million might seem like a stretch. But over time, look at ways you can give more time or more money or both, and I promise you, um, Robert and his staff will find a way to engage you in that process, and just would encourage you to do that. Um, I was asked about a year ago, I think, to speak, and I dodged it for a while because we had enough going on at the bank that I didn't think getting out and speaking might be good. Now I'm just happy to get invited anywhere, so I really am glad <laughs> I'm, I'm here today. But when I talked about managing through troubled times, I really didn't know at the time if we would be through these troubled times. Quite frankly, I didn't know if these troubled times would be through with us. Um, I didn't know if there would be a banking industry as we knew it a year ago today. And there were days I didn't know if I would even be leading a bank by the time I gave this talk. Um, I'm still not sure I can answer the first three questions, but I can tell you um, that I'm really proud to be the CEO and representing today the Bank of North Georgia and Synovus um, Financial. It's a great company here um, in Atlanta. It's a great company throughout the southeast, and I'm just fortunate to be a part of it. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've navigated, um, and um, I'm sure some of you all have better ideas um, as well. probably comes as no surprise to you that in over 30 years of banking, though, I've never seen times as challenging as these over the last 18 months, and I hope they're over soon. Um, I don't really need a reminder of what we've been through, but our staff has prepared a little video in case some of y'all do. So at this point, I'm going to pause for a minute and let you watch a very brief video that kind of tells you what we've been through and hopefully where we, where we are today. Dark, dismal, dreary, words.
records that fit the state of our national and local economy the past couple of years. It's been a turbulent time and an unpredictable ride. But like all storms, we are weathering them together. Through our country's hard work and determination, we believe better days are coming. Slowly, surely, because defeat is simply not an option. And one day, these dark days, these trying economic times, will be a part of history, a part of who we were, not who we are, left only in memories and written on the pages of our past. We are proud to be a part of this resilient country where we know how to bounce back, how to survive, and how to hold on until the clouds part and we see the sun again. Welcome to today. I hope you in, in, enjoyed that. Maybe that in just about a minute told you some of the things that, that uh, we've been through. I heard last month, and I was not able to be here, that, that Leo Wells spoke and that the topic of his speech was why I love this recession. And so I want to start by saying I want some of whatever he was drinking that morning. Um, and if you all would, send him that video and, uh, and tell him to call me. And in all seriousness, for those of you all that don't know Leo Wells, he is a great leader in this city, um, and he's the kind of leader that a lot of us look up to because he cares as much about the values and ethics of how he does business as he does about how much money he earns through his business. So um, I'm sorry I was not able to um, be here for Leo. But this really has seemed like a nightmare for a lot of us, but it actually has presented a lot of opportunities for personal and corporate growth. And I'd like to just talk a few minutes today about how our company navigated through these troubled waters and why we really are optimistic about the future. Now, speaking about troubled waters, there's a Swedish proverb that goes, rough waters are a truer test of leadership. In calm waters, every ship has a good captain. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I feel like one of those guys on the deadliest catch these days. And um, I know my team feels like some of the deckhands, the way we um, bark orders at them sometimes. Um, we don't claim to have all of the answers at Bank of North Georgia or Synovus. We've learned a lot, but I believe leaders never quit learning. So I really do say to you what I'm going to share is what was important to us, some of the core values that guided us through. And if you have better ideas, call me, email me. I would love to hear them. Now, you saw the video about how bad things were, and I'm going to give you a Larry Munson line and help you get the picture because today I don't want to talk about Lehman or Bear or Indy Mac names in the past, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, CRA. I want to talk about the state of Georgia and help bring this picture a little closer to home. On January the 1st, 2008, there were 352 banks in the state of Georgia. That was more than California, by the way. And so I'll let you form your own opinion as to whether that was too many. But 352 was more than California. Five closed in 2008, 25 closed in 2009, two so far this year. For those of y'all that are a little slow, that's 32. Um, 25 to 50 more are estimated to go this year, and I'm not a pessimist, you'll hear that later, but if I'm a betting man, I'd bet on the high side of that range. That's 32 in the past 26 months, 33 in the previous 38 years. So I think that helps you get a picture of really how bad and devastating um, this crisis has been to um, a lot of you, but in particular the Georgia um, financial community. I do want to clear up a couple of uh, misperceptions about this crisis. You know, bankers have now learned to spell FDIC about a hundred different ways, and I know more about the FDIC today than in my previous 30 years of banking. But there is not a depositor in the world, that's lo in the United States, that's lost a penny of FDIC insured deposits during all of this crisis. And sometimes people think of bank failures and how catastrophic. No one has lost a penny of FDIC insured deposits. In fact, um, even those banks that went through just deposit assumptions, most of those acquiring banks acquired all of the deposits, not just the insured deposits. And in our case, 
a bank in North Atlanta, we did the same thing. We acquired all of the deposits, not just the insured deposits. So um, you hear of bad things, but um, our system is working. Now, it may not be working for those that have gone out of business, but as far as you, um, the business community, the system is working. And unfortunately, some very good banks, led by some very good bankers um, that are friends of mine, um, have gone out of business. I want to turn to TARP for a minute. I'm sure most people here have heard about TARP. Um, and if you haven't, you've probably not been um, reading too much. But TARP is misunderstood as well. And we have a lot of real estate people here today, and I, I love all of you. I really do. Um, some of you, by the way, owe us some money. I want to talk to you all later. <laughs> But you know, a common defense now when we say to customers, well, you owe us money, they're like, well, you took TARP. And so we like to argue, I'm like, well, yeah, and I'm paying mine back and you're not, okay? So that's the, that's the difference. TARP is referred to as a bailout. It may prove to be a bailout for the auto industry, but it's not a bailout for the banking industry. It's an investment that bears a 5% coupon. And we're paying, we made our payment Tuesday this week, 5% on the money we took. A lot of banks have already paid theirs back. Um, and I would argue that over time, TARP will be viewed as an investment that paid tremendous dividends for this country and for you, the taxpayer, over time, and that the Treasury will come out whole. Now, you can argue that. And have there been, this, have there been some banks that probably deserve to get it that didn't? Yeah, there probably are. Um, has it really been unfair to some of the community banks in Atlanta that argue they couldn't deal with their problems because they didn't get TARP money? Yeah, it's probably been a little unfair to them. But Again, will the vast majority of TARP funds that have been invested in the financial community be repaid with the return to the Treasury? I would argue yes. And the history, again, will judge TARP as not a bailout for the banking industry, but a decision that was made to save a system from the verge of collapse and that at the, in the, at the end of the day will pay, again, big dividends. Well, enough editorial comments. I know there's some people that don't like TARP and bank bailouts and wish we'd all failed and so, um, and y'all usually call me anyway, so I'll hear from you later. <laughs> but let me just acknowledge the last couple of years has not been fun. I'm a guy, you know me well, I really do like to have fun, but it hasn't been fun. But I really am confident that there are brighter days ahead. Now, in the audience today, I've got a lot of friends, but I have right over here Tim Benson, who um, is with KPMG, and Tim has been the managing partner, and has been over the Synovus relationship. And Tim and I have argued over the years about impairments and loan loss reserves, and he's won every one of them. So, Tim, I give up. Matter of fact, I asked him, why are you here today? Because you've won all the arguments. And he said, I'm here to make sure you don't make any forward-looking statements. <laughs> so, Tim, here I go. Um, and I'm going to confess, I, did this, I actually did this two years ago um, at a um, banking conference that was sponsored by the Terry College. And two years ago, I stood up and said, look, I, and it was February two years ago, I said, I promise you guys things will be better in the spring. I just can't tell you spring of what year. Um, that was in February of 2008. I'm going to say it again today. It's 2010, and I actually think things are going to be better this spring, um, as shared by some of the experts in the room today, and I think in the springs beyond. But you know what? We've survived. We're here. And again, I'm just going to share a few of the key ingredients that have been important to guide our company through it. Um, and hopefully you'll find some value there. And if not, you had a free breakfast. And so I hope it was still worth your while. Well, for us, it really was and it is about getting back to the basics. This, this um, crisis we've been in, there's just no textbook at Terry College or Wharton or anywhere else that would tell you how to get through what we've been through. There are no business courses. There are no regulatory guidelines. There are no manuals. There are no seminars. There are no consultants or anything that would have prepared us for the real estate collapse in Atlanta and in Georgia that we've been through. Now, I'll admit, as bankers, at first, we thought, this is going back to 2007, that this is kind of like a high tide and it's a little higher than usual. Something doesn't feel right. And then it kept coming and we thought, well, maybe it's a, maybe it's a full moon. And, and then we found out it really was a tsunami and it hit us. And it hit us hard, and by the time it did, it was just too late to run for the hills. And we've got a lot of Monday morning quarterbacks, regulators, who I love, by the way. If there are any regulators here, I love all y'all. Um, <laughs> but some have said, well, we saw it coming, and, you know, we told you it was coming, and why didn't you do something about it? Well, for anybody 
that saw it coming. I just, I just wish you'd have told me because you didn't. Um, and again, it began for us as a creep on the south and east and west sides of Atlanta. And we thought, well, this is just those markets. And then it engulfed us on the north and it soon became an equal opportunity collapse. So how did we get through it? I want to talk about just a few things that, that were important to us um, to get through it. And, you know, they're overused, but I would tell you that in times of crisis, you get back to some of the things we're going to talk about today and it'll serve you well. You know, first leadership, if you know anything about Synovus or Bank of North Georgia or any of our family of companies, you hear us talk about leadership and more importantly, servant leadership. Robert Greenleaf said good leaders must first become good servants. And this principle is practiced by our company every day at every level of the organization. We don't think leadership um, starts or ends in the boardroom or at the CEO level. It, it, is, it is pushed down through our, all of our company, and we don't believe any company can thrive and survive without a commitment to leadership at all levels. I actually met with one of our senior officers who's here today a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about the assets we had moved out of his department. In the old days, how much you had in loans outstanding um, was a sign of value to the bank. Now nobody pays loans back, so the outstandings just grow. But he was concerned as we transferred these out about value to the bank, and I shared with him that, look, I value you more for your leadership and how you represent this company and how people look at you than any loan you've ever generated. And that's what's important to me as the CEO of Bank of North Georgia. You know, a leader doesn't gain the trust and respect of his people or his peers by any title he's ever given. A CEO used to be a um, title of pride. Um, bank CEO kind of was too. Now it's a four-letter word um, and can actually be a liability. I'll, I'll share a quick story. I was in Columbus about a year ago, and we really do go through some pretty scary things these days, and we've beefed up security. But I was in Columbus, and I called in, and someone said that there was an irate customer who said he was going to blow up the bank, and he was going to come in and kill the president. And I'm down in Columbus. I'm feeling pretty pretty sporty because I'm in Columbus and he's talking about Atlanta and the head of our credit department had always wanted to be president. So I was out for two days. I said, tell Bill he's a president and move into my office. Um, <laughs> because as most of y'all know, credit guys are always expendable. And so, um, <laughs> but, but like I said, you really don't earn anything from your employees by any title like CEO or senior VP or anything like that. You earn it by what you say and by what you do every day of every week of every year and your employees especially today watch everything you do and they watch how you say it and they watch how you do it they watch how you walk down the hall they watch the velocity with which you close your door they watch everything you do and I preach it to our leaders all the time that everybody's watching everything you do I had one of our officers come up to me a couple of months ago and say, I'm praying for you, which I'm like, that's a good thing. I'm glad you're praying for me, but why today are you praying for me? And she said, well, I saw you leave yesterday, and I saw you kind of wander through the parking lot looking down with this really bad look on your face. Now, I had no idea somebody was watching me out the window, and it may have been a loan that had defaulted. It might have been a regulator that had given me a pep talk. Um, it might have been that um, we lost a big football game that weekend. I don't, I don't know what it was, but it hit me that day that people are watching everything we do, and I can't afford to have any employee or officer of our company that has any doubts in my confidence to get to the other side. So I preach it to people every day. People are watching as leaders everything you do. And I'm a big believer that, that good leaders have to care about every person at every level of the organization. At Bank of North Georgia and at Synovus, we don't ask our employees to do anything that the leaders won't do themselves. And I believe very much, and I hope you do too, in the John Maxwell quote, he says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. If you think about that, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And in today's environment, when in a lot of our businesses there's not much we can do for our employees, telling them how much you care um, is probably as good a thing as you can do for them. At our company, again, we expect it and insist it of all of our leaders, and I think that's advice that all of us could take um, every day. Before I leave leadership, I want to quickly touch on the University of Georgia. Most of y'all are probably graduates. Again, some of you are here to make sure I don't misspeak, and some of you are here because somebody invited you to breakfast. But very quickly on the University of Georgia and leadership, you know, you read the controversial things, but very quickly, I'll speak 
to Mike Adams. Times are tough right now and budgets are tough, but Mike Adams is out there fighting for the University of Georgia every day for money, for funding, for faculty. He was a little slow on the defensive coordinator. I've talked to him about that. <laughs> um, but he's fighting for the university every day because that's what leadership is all about. And our new provost, who's not here today, and Robert, if you would share with him how disappointed I am that he's not here, because Jerry Moorhead, if you all don't know Jerry, Jerry and I were um, advisors to a fraternity for many years together. A lot of those guys are here today. Advisors to a fraternity um, at UGA is tougher than running a bank, I can assure you that. But Jerry Moorhead, talk about servant leadership, and if you don't know Jerry, he, he serves the students, and he, put the stu he puts our students ahead of anything else. And finally, Robert Summercrass, I've talked about what he's doing for the university, and Robert, you don't know this, but at that same black tie dinner, um, Saturday night, uh, Rob Hoyt, who is the head of our School of Risk Management, Insurance, Legal Studies, Real Estate, some of the schools ranked two and three of the year. I went up to Rob and I thanked him for what he was doing, and I said, I know it's tough out there. He goes, yeah, it's tough, but he said, I don't know how he's doing it, but Robert is giving us everything we need to be successful. So you hear of budget cuts and you hear of teacher furloughs and horrible things, but yet a guy who runs one of the best schools at our university is saying Robert gives us everything we need and that's what good leaders do. Now let me move from leadership and I would tell you that no good leader um, can do anything without a resilient team. I'm going to talk about mine and I would just tell you if you don't have one um, you're in trouble and you better, better um, get one. And I want to start with the very top of the company and that's at the board level and I've given this um, advice before at a bank director's conference. It really didn't go over very well, but I gave it anyway. I'll give it again because when I say resilient team, I mean at all levels and and if you are dealing with a board of directors and that board of directors is not giving you every bit of support you need as a leader of the company, then you can't be successful. So I have said before to boards of directors, if you're not supporting your CEO, you ought to get off the board or fire the CEO. And I really mean that. You've got to do one or the other because in these troubled times, a CEO can't be successful if he's watching his back with his own board. So when I talk about resilient team, um, I start with the board of directors of any company and take whatever industry you're in and apply that as well. Um, but then below that board and below the CEO, um, it, gets, it gets even tougher. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have one of the best teams, and it's not just as bankers, but one of the best teams that I've ever been associated with. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur said a general is just as good or just as bad as the troops under his command make him. And I feel that way about the troops I've got. A lot of them are here today, and I want to tell them all that I would go to war with them any day. And we've been through some wars over the last couple of years. I especially want to thank um, Don Howard, who is chairman of the Bank of North Georgia. And when I came into the bank four years ago, I didn't have gray hair. I weighed 160 pounds. Um, I didn't drink. I'm going too far now. Um, <laughs> um, no one mentored me and, and, and provided me more with a shoulder to lean on and cry on than Don. And Don, I can't thank you enough for your leadership throughout our company at Bank of North Georgia. But again, there are a bunch of them here today, and they're the most resilient team members I've ever been associated with. We had a senior executive at Synovus recently, and this is an exception, I hope, but he quit. He, re he retired, but he quit. And I called him, and I said, why are you quitting? And he said, well, I'm not quitting. I'm retiring. I'm like, no, you're quitting. Why are you quitting? And he said, well, first of all, I'm tired of going home grumpy to my wife. Now, he didn't say he was tired of going home to his grumpy wife. He said, I'm tired of going home grumpy to my wife. He said, I'm tired of going to my country club and having people whisper about me. I'm tired of going to, into the community and have people call me names. I'm tired of going to church and have people look at me funny. I'm just tired of being a banker. And that's tough. And if you're in our industry, that's tough. Um, but, you know, Babe Ruth, I don't know, I'll talk about Babe Ruth a little later, but Babe Ruth said, it's hard to beat a person who never gives up. It's a great quote, pretty simple. It's hard to beat a person that never gives up. And I would say this about my team and hopefully your team. There's no quit in them. And I say that to them all the time. There can't be any quit in this team because once that happens, things start to fall. I said a couple of years ago when I saw this, when I realized it really was a tsunami, I got my senior leadership together. I said, look, one of two things is going to happen as we go through this. People are going to split, splinter, divide, and run for the hills. 
or they're going to pull together as a tight-knit group. And I'm proud to say um, at our bank, we haven't had a person leave our organization at the senior level. Not one person has quit or run for the hills. I want to give you a few characteristics about them that I hope you find in your own teams. And if you don't, again, I would argue you need to switch out your teams. Um, number one, they behave no differently in good times than in bad. They're men and women of strong character. They're goal-oriented. They're focused and committed to do their best and looking beyond their own situation to help others. They feel the joy and the pain of their customers, and they really do look forward to the good days ahead where we can all participate in the uh, economic recovery. Again, at Bank of North Georgia and at Synovus, we have a very, I think, unique culture of putting our people first. You probably do that too, but I'm really proud of that. I want to describe something at our company that I'm not proud of, okay? We've had continued operating losses. We haven't given pay raises in a couple of years in most cases. I hadn't got one, so that's what counts. No pay raises, <laughs> no bonuses. So you hear about fat cat bankers and no bonuses that I know of. Don, I don't think any that you know of. Significant reductions in headcount at our company, over 100 people. And guess what? The work had to go on. So those that remain, we said you got to work harder for no pay, no bonuses, no increase in benefits. We just need more hours. We need you to work harder. And yet, for the second year in a row, our people, our resilient team, voted our company one of the best places to work in Atlanta, as recognized by the Atlanta Business Chronicle. I think we were number two or three or Nobody can dispute it if you're, not, if you're not here from the Business Chronicles, so maybe we were number one. But we were the only, <laughs> only bank in the large business category to be voted by our team members as a great place to work, when all I've done as a leader is cut pay, cut bonuses, increase hours, cut people, and it's just a testimony to the resiliency of our team. Georgia Trend has recognized us two years in a row um, as one of the top 15 places in the state to work. Um, something I'm really proud of, I would just tell you at your company, um, I would put your people first and everything else usually um, takes care of itself. Now, with a good team, you got to have the ability to adapt to change. Um, the author Thomas Crum says, instead of seeing the rug pulled out from under us, we can learn to dance on a shifting carpet. If you're a banker and you hadn't learned to dance by now, you're toast, I'm telling you, um, because things have changed a lot. As bankers, for some of y'all have been around for a long time. I've heard a lot of the ex-CNS stories today from George Boltwood and others. These guys have been around for a really long time, um, um, George. Um, but we all remember the days when to do a loan, you got prime plus two and two points, and that's just what you did. And you did a couple of those every morning, and then you went and played golf. So prime plus two and two was the norm, and I remember when it went to prime plus one and one. And then I went, remember when it went to prime and no fee. And we wondered, you know, how are we going to make money doing it this way? And then that LIBOR guy showed up in town. And, you know, if I could have found him, I'd have shot him. I think he's wounded right now, by the way. Um, we couldn't figure out who a LIBOR was, but we, know, we knew it was eating into our margins. And we just moaned and groaned about our interest spreads and how we would ever make money again um, because there was so little interest getting paid. Now, the flip side of that now is if your customer paying us interest, we'll put you in the annual report. But I'm going back. <laughs> I'm going back a few years. You know, we thought you couldn't, you couldn't lose money by lending 75% on a house. You couldn't lend, lose money by lending 75% on a development. Um, we went from a nine-month supply of lots in some areas of Atlanta. We had some builders in 2006 that were screaming they couldn't get lots to now over a 40-year supply in some of the outlying areas. And bankers very quickly learned to say, 30 cents on the dollar with a smile on our face. I mean, that's just what's happened. Our whole world has changed. The economy's changed. The banking model has changed. The regulators have changed, again, for the better. If any regulators are here, we love you all. Um, but all that's changed, and our people have had to adapt as well. Our very best performers have had to learn all new jobs. I wasn't going to single him out, but Frank Radel was head of corporate banking, and now he runs special assets. So if you're in there, um, you are special to us, um, but it means that there's maybe something difficult going on. And again, some of you guys owe Frank some money, and so Frank, if you would kind of stand at the door when they leave, and uh, right there he'll be, uh, he's an Illinois guy, he'll be blocking the door. But we've taken our top producers of business and put them into jobs they never thought in a million years they'd be doing, working out problems, selling real estate. They're still great salespeople, they're just selling something different. They're not selling service, they're selling assets. 
You may have heard this about Sonovas. We've been very aggressive in disposing of problem assets. Some of the community banks have criticized us for that, thinking we are um, negatively influencing the market. I don't believe that's true. The market is the market. Um, and I believe our strategy of disposition, which sometimes gets criticized, sometimes gets praised, but I, I believe that strategy will, over time, be proven to be the right strategy. And with all these changes, as leaders, what we've just promised to do is communicate everything we can with honesty and sincerity. And I believe in our company, we've had 100% buy-in. And someone once said, never waste a good crisis. So we had all this going on. We also decided about a year ago to just re-engineer our company while it was going on. So we took some of the top leaders, sent them to Columbus, and they spent six months generating over 700 ideas um, to re-engineer our company, which cost saved, revenue enhancements, generated over $75 million in pre-tax earnings. And if that wasn't enough, about three weeks ago, you may have heard us announce a change in our operating model that, that, that basically changed a 100-plus year model and our company of independently charter, chartered banks. If you didn't hear that, um, we're consolidating into a single charter. We believe it will be good for our company in terms of capital efficiency, in terms of regulatory um, simplicity. Um, there'll still be a very unique culture, local branding, local decision making. Um, we believe that above all things, it'll be good for our customers and good for us long term. And so if you haven't heard about that, you'll be hearing more about that um, going forward. Um, but speaking of customers, I want to talk about strong relationships that we have at our bank. Um, because if you don't have the strong relationships in times of crisis, you're just not going to get through. You need, need something to fall back on. And when I talk about strong relationships, I mean with our team that I've talked about, with our customers, with our communities, and with our other partners, um, some of whom are here today. Now, let me just say this about the team. I don't want to take them for granted. I've already talked about that. But without a good team, nothing else matters. So if your team relationship isn't built on trust and respect, um, nothing else is probably going to be possible. So I would probably urge you to focus on that first. But let me then turn to our customers. I think one of the biggest mistakes any company can make in a time like this is to dwell so much about your own problems and worry so much about yourself. Um, that you take your eye off the very people you're in business to serve. And so I would just urge you, regardless of your business, take care of the customer. Our company is relationship-driven culture, and we look for ways to do something better for our customer every day. Hands-on personal relationships are just a key fundamental core value of our company. And again, we really do try to make them stronger every day. And, and how we get personally involved, I'll tell you a quick story. We have a young man in our Buckhead office and this is a Christmas Eve story, and I've just always worked Christmas Eve. Banks work, you all make fun of our holidays, we work Christmas Eve. And I've always done that because I don't travel at Christmas and thought it would be good for the team to see me around. And so we have a young man in Buckhead who sent me an email, um, and it popped up about 1230 on Christmas Eve. We'd already closed the bank, and this young man, um, he has a, to, I'm not bragging, but to make the story make sense, he has a picture of me on his desk. Now that's a whole other story and I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> um, and I didn't ask him to put it there and I just heard the story but he's got a picture of me on the desk and so a customer had come in or a new prospect had come into that office to move money and they were going to bring put $100,000 in their bank because they were concerned about FDIC insurance. He quickly started telling them about the different ways you could get more insurance and he got them up to about $300,000 in new deposits and and told them about FDIC and FDIC.gov and how they could, they wanted some assurance that he was really telling them the truth. So he did his best and then he said the customer, and he put this in an email, the customer then looked at my picture and said, who's that guy? And he's like, he's our president. And they said, well, so is he going to call me later today and tell me everything you told me is true? And he said, he might. Well, he put that to me in an email and I wrote that number down to that customer and about two o'clock that day, I picked up the phone and called the customer. Now. You know, the customer at first thought it was a scam because I said, I'm Kessel Stelling, president of the bank, and, and thank you for coming in today on Christmas Eve. And I'm like, who are you? And I said, no, I really am. Um, and then they quickly started asking me about FDIC insurance. Now, any of y'all that know how banks work, the further you get from the front line, the less the person knows about FDIC insurance. So <laughs> I'm sitting there at 2 o'clock, and I think I've got ESPN Sports on my computer trying to see how the, what the line on the Georgia game is. And, and this customer, new customer, says, can you look at your... Uh, 
system and look at my accounts and tell me if I indeed have $300,000 in FDIC insurance. And so I said, you know, my, our system's gone down. It's Christmas Eve, but I, <laughs> by God, if, if that employee told you that, then it's true, and I'll get back to you on Monday. And so we got back to him on Monday. But the point was we've empowered our people, um, and just that personal touch to a customer, I would just argue there's nothing more powerful. There's nothing more rewarding to me, and maybe try it sometime at the end of every day, no matter how bad your day is. If you close your day by picking up the phone and calling a customer and saying thank you very much, I guarantee it'll make your customer feel really good, and it'll probably make you feel good too. So let me say it now um, to customers of ours that are in this room, and I, I say this with no no arrogance or cockiness. I say it just from the heart. We really do believe what defines our bank is the quality of our customers. And I could start calling names out today because I'm making eye contact with some of you, but we really do believe that the quality of our customer defines our bank. So if you are a customer of our bank today, I would just say thank you very much um, for what you do for us. If you're not, I would argue you're missing a good opportunity and I've got a team full of people um, that would love to talk to you about um, our bank and how you might could become a customer. Now, I talked about team, I talked about customer. Let me talk about our communities. Nobody, no community, no charity, no body that's dependent on a healthy business climate thinks that we're doing enough right now to support them. And we understand that. Um, but we're doing all we can. We're trying to do it in good times and in bad. And we do it because it's the right thing to do, but sometimes it pays dividends. We had a success, success story just two weeks ago where a local municipality, I won't name them,